Okay, um, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome, and uh, thanks in particular to Roosevelt House for hosting uh, this, uh, this event. Uh, my name is Alan Leidner, and uh, I've known Jack uh, since 1990. And um, I've been in GIS in New York City uh, here and there uh, for all that time since 1990. And um, uh, Jin Wen, who is the current president of New York City Gizmo, uh, is unable to be with us tonight. She was going to play the job of uh, host this evening, but she has uh, a health problem, an issue that she has to deal with, so she couldn't make it. Very regrettably, she wanted to be here so much. Uh, she looked forward to it. She wrote a whole introduction for it, but unfortunately, um, um, you know, she has to remain home uh, this evening. So I will do my best to carry on. Um, so we are here to honor and remember and celebrate our friend, Dr. Jack Eichenbaum, and I remind everyone because he never wore it uh, overtly. Uh, he was a PhD in urban geography from the University of Michigan. Um, but again, he was extremely humble. We never, for the most part, knew it. I mean, it came out almost by accident. Um, GIS is a communal technology. That is, uh, you get more out of it, the more relationships you have, the more collaborators you have, the more people who come together, the more people in particular who have data, who you can share with, because it's combinations of data that solve problems in this world. And um, Jack understood that. Um, uh, and, and Jack was perfect for us because he loved to create communities and you're all uh, evidence of that because if you looking out, I see the Gizmo community. I see the Hunter College Department of Geography and Environmental Science community, the Queens Historical Society community, the walking tours community. Uh, he would travel internationally and had a whole host of contacts internationally. And I understand there was also a Scrabble community and probably untold numbers of other communities. Every chance Jack got to create a community, he created it. And thank God for that because uh, for the GIS people here, we know how important it was for him to create the GIS community. Many of us owe our careers to Jack, or at least uh, a good part of our, uh, our, our careers to the fact that we interacted with him, that he inspired us, that he encouraged us. And um, we have tonight speakers from a number of different aspects of his life and his engagement who will memorialize him, who will speak about him. And um, so without much ado, uh, I would, Amy, you're next on the agenda. You have something to read, so please do. But again, welcome everybody. And uh, hopefully this, this, you will enjoy this time with Jack. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. I'm gonna be reading an excerpt from The Little Prince. The sixth planet was 10 times larger than the last one. It was inhabited by an old gentleman who wrote voluminous books. Oh, look, here's an explorer, he exclaimed to himself when he saw the little prince coming. The little prince sat down on the table and panted a little. He had already traveled so much and so far. Where do you come from? The old gentleman said to him. What is that big book? said the little prince. What are you doing? I am a geographer, said the old gentleman. What is a geographer? asked the little prince. A geographer is a scholar who knows the location of all the seas, rivers, towns, mountains, and deserts. That is very interesting, said the little prince. Here at last is a man who has a real profession, and he cast a look around him at the planet of the geographer. It was the most magnificent and stately planet that he had ever seen. Your planet is very beautiful, he said. Has it any oceans? I couldn't tell you, said the geographer. Ah, the little prince was disappointed. Has it any mountains? I couldn't tell you, said the geographer. And towns and rivers and deserts? 
I couldn't tell you that either. But you are a geographer. Exactly, the geographer said, but I am not an explorer. I haven't a single explorer on my planet. It is not the geographer who goes out to count the towns, the rivers, the mountains, the seas, the oceans, and the deserts. The geographer is much too important to go loafing around. He does not leave his desk, but he receives the explorers in his study. He asks them questions and he notes down what they recall of their travels. And if the recollections of anyone among them seem interesting to him, the geographer orders an inquiry into the explorer's moral character. Why is that? Because an explorer who told lies would bring disaster on the books of the geographer. So would an explorer who drank too much. Why is that? Asked the little prince. Because intoxicated men see double. Then the geographer would note down two mountains in a place where there was only one. I know someone, said the little prince, who would make a bad explorer. That is possible. Then when the moral character of the explorer is shown to be good, an inquiry is ordered into his discovery. One goes to see it? No, that would be too complicated. But one requires the explorer to furnish proofs. For example, if the discovery in question is that of a large mountain, one requires that large stones be brought back from it. The geographer was suddenly stirred to excitement. But you, you come from far away. You are an explorer. You shall describe your planet to me. And having opened his big register, the geographer sharpened his pencil. The recitals of explorers are put down first in pencil. One waits until the explorer has furnished proofs before putting them down in ink. Well, said the geographer expectantly. Oh, where I live, said the little prince, it is not very interesting. It is all so small. I have three volcanoes. Two volcanoes are active and the other is extinct. But one never knows. One never knows, said the geographer. I also have a flower. We do not record flowers, said the geographer. Why is that? The flower is the most beautiful thing on my planet. We do not record them, said the geographer because they're ephemeral. What does that mean, ephemeral? Geographies, said the geographer, are the books which, of all books, are most concerned with matters of consequence. They never become old fashioned. It is very rarely that a mountain changes its position. It is very rarely that an ocean empties itself of its waters. We write of eternal things, but extinct volcanoes may come to life again, the little prince interrupted. What does that mean, ephemeral? Whether volcanoes are extinct or alive, it comes to the same thing for us, said the geographer. The thing that matters to us is the mountain. It does not change. But what does that mean, ephemeral, repeated the little prince, who never in his life had let go of a question once he had asked it. It means which is in danger of speedy disappearance. Is my flower in danger of speedy disappearance? Certainly it is. My flower is ephemeral, the little prince said to himself, and she has only four th thorns to defend herself against the world. And I have left her on my planet all alone. That was his first moment of regret but he took courage once more. What place would you advise me to visit now? He asked. The planet Earth, replied the geographer. It has a good reputation. And the little prince went away thinking of his flower. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, and I would also point out that Amy was the um, was a significant force behind a lot of the organizing that went into this event. So, Amy, thank you so much for for your efforts. 
so now, now we'll start uh, having some speakers talk about uh, about their encounters and their um, uh, their time with Jack. Uh, I will start it off. Uh, and uh, Wendy will follow. Steve Romoluski, who was scheduled, is uh, came down with what he thinks is RSV, so uh, he can't make it. So it'll only be two from from Gizmo, Wendy, and myself. Um, I first met Jack around 1990, as I mentioned before, as he was forming Gizmo. He was a geographer, and he, of all the geographers in New York City, decided that he was going to form a GIS organization. God bless him. Uh, I was drawn to him, as many others were, by his warmth and his enthusiasm and his just uh, charisma and organizing ability. Uh, at the same time, I was also working for the Department of Environmental Protection, and we knew we needed something, a common map, in order to uh, move forward with a lot of the programs and a lot of the operations, because everything in DEP, as it is with almost every agency, has to do with location. So, um, you know, I joined up with Gizmo, as did many of the people I, I knew and worked with. Um, and he was a one man show. He started to draw people in. Uh, he organized committees. He held monthly meetings at the Fund for the City of New York, now long gone from us. Um, and uh, before you knew it, Gizmo had 400 members. There were no dues. You just came. Uh, but there were 400 members. It was an enormous number. It showed the power and the interest in location in New York City. And um, one of the initial things that we did and, and organized was we knew the city needed uh, a common base map for, because there were individual GIS efforts occurring in many different agencies and they were building data layers on different foundations. And we knew that for that data to be interactive, they all had to be registered to a common base map. And Jack knew this and he worked with us and we went to politicians and we went to administrators and we went, you know, anyone who would listen to us and we agitated for the city to develop a base map. And it took four or five years as these things do, but the city finally agreed to spend the one or $2 million it would take to fly the aerial photography. In fact, Jim, uh, Jim Hall is here, remembers those days when we initiated the base map development and Sean Ahern as well, because he was one of the people who developed the specifications for the overflight. And sure enough, you know, Jack was there and we built the base map, uh, which now has something like a thousand plus layers registered to it and hundreds of applications across every city agency. And I don't know if that would have happened if it weren't for Jack being around organizing gizmo and giving us a home where we could talk to colleagues and organize efforts um the other um so that that was in 1996 through um 1999 the base map was completed well we all know what happened on 9 11 and after the attack uh i re i recall being told you have to make maps we need maps we have to know what's going on on the ground and um, I called together, at that point, I was the uh, GIO of the city at that point in time. And I called together my most reliable people in Gizmo, including Wendy and Jack and a number of others. And uh, we said, we, we have to, this is going to be a massive effort because this is such an incredible catastrophe that there's gonna be hundreds, dozens, hundreds of requests for information. We need GIS people to work on the emergency mapping and data center. And Jack and Wendy too got on, got their Rolodexes out and started to call everybody they knew and said, will you come down to the emergency mapping and data center? Will you work and volunteer to help the city deal with this emergency, this crisis? And they came and we had 75 or more people working shifts 24 seven, uh, developing maps. It turned out in the first six weeks, it was uh, something like 3000 maps that were supplied to uh, the entire response community, which numbered in the thousands actually. And I just remember Jack on his phone calling people and getting them down. And then on a day-to-day -day basis, creating maps, working you know, hand, hands on uh, to produce the product that was being asked for by the response community. He was, every, he was there every day. Um, Jack was an evangelist. 
He preached the gospel of field verification of data. Some of you have probably, you know, caught, caught wind of that uh, multiple times. And he also constantly was urging us to, um, to connect with adjoining jurisdictions because he understood that just as important as it was to connect organizations within a city, it was also important to connect cities and counties and states together uh, because just taking the example of a disaster doesn't respect boundaries. And Jack was right about that and he kept on preaching it and preaching it. Um, Jack loved people, he loved leading tours, he loved teaching, he liked working with Gizmo and attending and leading Gizmo meetings, um, and we love him back. So that, that's really what I have to say about, about Jack at this point. And uh, I'd like to introduce my colleague of many, many years, Wendy Dorf, um, to speak. Wendy. Good evening to all of you. I see many familiar faces in the room. Um, it's an honor to be here to mem memorialize Jack. Um, my spin, since Alan has practically given the history of our careers beyond 30, maybe 40 years, uh, trying to get this technology to become everywhere. So uh, I wish to thank my Gizmo colleagues for the opportunity to honor our friend and Gizmo founder Jack Eichenbaum. What began as my half-hearted attendance at a fledgling organization in the early 90s turned out to be the center for collegial support that enabled me to persist in a project for more than 40 years. By the way, the project is uh, mapping the underground and uh, th there was a kickoff meeting. The city is going to start doing the underground. Are they able to hear the beginning? Yeah, no, no. Okay, uh, the city is uh, just had a kickoff meeting to begin mapping the underground and it'll be integrated with what's above ground and uh, it's a real milestone to connect these, uh, the, the upper and lower part of the city uh, for the future, for global warming, for dealing with flooding and saving lives. So we're very excited about that. And uh, it's personally uh, a terrific thing with many, many people to thank for making it happen over the years. Um, anyway, I traveled from Manhattan to Manhattan from DEP, which was located in Queens, to attend my first Gizmo meeting. At, at the time, I was managing a project to create a digital map of our water supply system. The concept was brand new, and although I was and still am diligently devoted when given a challenging task, reluctantly, I decided to attend the Gizmo meeting. Much to my surprise, the room was filled with attendees from the public and private sectors, each engaged in GIS. Additionally, lunch was provided while representatives from these organizations presented any number of unique GIS applications dem demonstrating the, ag the agility of the technology. My early resistance evaporated and I began to look forward to the academic and social interaction with my peers. Many of those relationships have continued for the past 30 years as the technology advanced. Jack's meetings were so successful that conversations drifted into the street when the doors closed. These conversations were known as the long goodbye. We got so involved in the conversation, sometimes we forgot the direction of the subways we were taking to go home. So Jack provided an atmosphere in these meetings in which participants were comfortable and eager to share their knowledge since GIS is about sharing data. Jack set the tone that created relationships resulting in an army of GIS experts who were readily available when called to serve to create maps for first responders during 9-11. So who was this guy? In the beginning, we realized that he was a visionary and understood the value of GIS in his work at the Department of Finance. However, not many people become a catalyst for GIS technology. We also learned that he was a certified scholar. When Jack made a presentation, it was always fascinating as he brought his academic knowledge to enhance the presentation. Everyone in attendance knew that they were hearing something completely original. 
On a personal note, Jack and I shared a similar simple outlook in life. We both believed that events are not incidental, that you are paying if you are paying attention, there is a message and a direction to follow. In general, we were soulmates. However, on one occasion, he lost his temper with me. I was not a fan of Queens, as I live in Brooklyn and was commuting daily to DEP in Queens. I, I learned never again to say anything negative about Queens to Jack. <laughs> Jack was more passionate about Queens than just about everything. Queens was lucky to have him as their historian. The real, the real key to Jack was his inclusive social skill. The people he met just intuitively felt his interest in them. He met people in his extensive travels around the world, and he kept up with these relationships. He fostered lasting relationships at Gizmo that have been key in advancing the technology. We have achieved remarkable mapping advances in our city with the so support of relationship with our, with our Gizno, Gizmo colleagues. We are ever grateful to Jack. He was a gift to our city and to the world. As most of you know, Jack suffered greatly during the isolation created by COVID. On occasion when the disease was more in hand, Gizmo, co Gizmo colleagues visited Jack. He loved introducing us to Flushing restaurants, and we loved it too. He began thinking of moving to a residence suggested to him co coincidentally near my home in Brooklyn. My husband Bob and I were with him while he was considering a change. Long story short, when COVID eased, Jack found social outlets in Queens. We learned that he was on a cruise just before he passed away. We are so happy that Jack, the world traveler, among so many other amazing things, was back in life at his end. We will miss him. May Jack's memory be a blessing. And, and, and make no mistake about it, the GIS, the GIS in New York City, which in part was due to the action of Gizmo, which was in large measure because Jack organized Gizmo. The GIS in New York is one of the strongest in the world. And, um, and it's just built on strength, but the initial strength I think came out of its roots, which were in Jack and Jack's work organizing Gizmo. Uh, I now like to bring up uh, Mariano Pavlovskaya, uh, who is the uh, chair of the department at Hunter, uh, Department of Geology and Environmental Sciences. Thank you, Ellen. Good to see you. Hi, I just want to note we are geography and environment. So. <laughs> You're not the first person who flips it around, but we always kind of try to... Uh, okay, Amy, so what do I do now? Okay. So why don't I start, and if you no. connect... Oh, oh, it's already right there. Just ah. the next one. Ah, excellent. Okay, well, thank you so much. Okay, so first, um, I'm Mariana Pavlovska. I'm chair of the Department of Geography and Environmental Science at Hunter College, and Jack has been related to us in many different ways, and I'm just going to talk about some of them, and my colleagues, Ines Miyares and Shona Hearn, uh, will follow with their own um, memories um, about Jack. So, but first I would like to thank uh, Roosevelt House that provided this venue for us. I also would like to thank, obviously, Amy Jew and also the other staff from our department, Marina Avanesian, who was there greeting everyone. And um, um, I'm very heartened to be able to sponsor this event. Um, and thank you, Gizmo people. Thanks I'm hearing, they are very, very moving. So, um, an urban geographer by training, Jack served our department for more than 16 years, teaching, mentoring students, and being a nice and, general, uh, and generous member of our community. For the longest time, he taught our geography of New York City metro area course, which could be called field geography of New York City, because majority of the course involved working with the students on the city streets and experiencing urban uh, space through Jack's narratives about it. And I believe Ines will uh, tell us more about that. 
So this approach to teaching the course aligned with Jack's most cherished thing to do, which already was mentioned here earlier, being a walking tour guide in the city. His favorite part was Queens, where he also served as the New York official borough historian. And um, if you now, now a few words about my personal connection to Jack. So one of the greatest things that Jack did for me was actually taking students in my class that I taught at the time on a walking trip to Queens, okay? So he did it without compensation as a favor to a colleague. And he, I could see how he ultimately like enjoyed talking to students about streets that we were walking on. And we met at the subway station and then we walked and walked and walked, I don't know for how long. And then we had dinner in a lo local restaurant. So not dinner, bite to it. And students were absolutely blown away by that experience of the city because they saw it through Jack's eyes as well as their own, right? So, um, and my gratitude personal to Jack for doing this trip has been immense. Um, another personal memory of him was from fall 2019, when we as a department revived the tradition of celebrating Geography Awareness Week with keynote speakers. Karen Sito, I don't know, maybe you guys know her, an urban geographer from Yale was the speaker. We uh, had this event in the glass cafeteria at Hunter College, which is very, very nice space. The food was great. Event was sponsored, I think, for the first time by the president of Hunter College. So it was nice. Jack came to this event, and at some point he came up to me and he said, Marianna, it was a great event. And then he looked at me with his smile, kind smile, and he said, women make the best department chairs. <laughs> and obviously he didn't have to say it, right? But he did. And this really stuck with me. And I remember with gratitude, you know, this comment that he made. So, um, but the most interesting thing is how Jack and I met in a sense when we first struck the first conversation about something significant. So it was a few years after I came to Hunter College. My PhD is from Clark University. Probably you know that this is one of the centers of what we call radical geography, right? Kind of critical geography that emerged in the United States in 1960s, 1970s. It, also, it is also the place that started publishing this journal. It's called Antipode. This is the issue from 1975, right? And today it is one of the most read and respected journals in geography, human geography. So um, why am I saying, talking about it? It is because on my door, I had this drawing, right? And this uh, map is conceptual map of human geography at the time. And unfortunately, you can see like details, but if you are interested, I printed a few copies for you guys. You can pick it up after uh, this event. And um, it was on my door for quite a long time. And then Jack stopped by by my door. And he said, hi, Mariana. I'm like, hi, Jack, how are you doing? And he, and he tells me, Mariana, this is my map. You have my map. I'm like, what are you talking about, Jack? I don't know what you mean. He says this, and he points to this, and he says, this is my map. And I was just puzzled because I could not juxtapose in my head the fact that this map comes from Radical Journal of Geography Antipod and Jack because I never thought that he had this connection. And he said, look at the corner of this map. Oops. Oh. Amy, it's not flying. Uh, okay, I guess we can't move it, right? The animation is not working. I prepared animation. Even. But you can see, like right there at the corner of the map, it actually says Jack Aikenbaum. 
So for me, it was like totally. Uh, uh, which one? Okay, thank you, Amy. Yes, it was it was it was discovery for me, and it was also very important for me as relatively new faculty at the department to kind of serendipitously find the person who had the same kind of thinking um, about geography as I did. And so for today, I looked some things up about him, and I found that a recently published volume, it was published in 2019, and it is called Spatial Histories of Radical Geography, North America and Beyond, actually mention Jack, okay? His dissertation and also reprint this map, okay? So let me just say a couple more words about it. So the chapter eight is called Radical Geography in the Midwest. And this is the chapter that actually talks about uh, Jack. So Jack earned his PhD as a background for you guys in, in geography from University of Michigan, as uh, you already mentioned, Alan, in 1972. And his advisor was Gunnar Olson. Gunnar Olson, probably geographers here know his name, was a quantitative geographer. So he came to University of Michigan as a quantitative geographer, and then he was transformed. He became one of the most prominent radical geographers at the university. And him and his students form one of the centers of radical geography in the United States, similar to what Clark University also became at the same time. And the reason why Olson changed his mind, it was because he realized that one can make, like map beautiful spatial pattern. You can have all locations marked, verified, and kind of laid out all together. But in order to explain what social forces led to the formation of this pattern, you need to look for social theoretical explanations. You need to look at structures of social power in order to explain how this pattern came about. So that was the aha moment for many radical geographers, people who became radical geographers in the 1960s. And Jack's advisor was one of them. So then it's not surprising that Jack actually made an important contribution to radical geography at that time. So for example, the first association, American Association of Geographers meeting where uh, this kind of radical geography formed self-organized was in 1969 in Ann Arbor. And that chapter mentions Jack as one of the key participants of that particular event, okay? And now I'm just gonna read a little quote from that chapter. <clears throat> so this is what they say. Most of Olson's graduate students considered themselves radical. They were engaged in a critical project to denaturalize and to demystify, to uncover structures of social power, and sometimes to advocate, sometimes to participate in progressive social change. Now, attention, quote, to see a better society, unquote. As Eichenbaum expressed it, in the preface to his doctoral thesis about the failure of urban renewal in Detroit's inner city neighborhood, neighborhood of uh, Corktown. So they specifically foreground Jack's perspective on radical geography and cite his dissertation. And then authors continue, the attempt to shift the course of geographical research to make it radical is what is illustrated in Eichenbaum's disciplinary map drawn at the end of his dissertation preface, okay? So in this map, Jack argues for the movement from the heartland that includes establishment, read status quo, right? To an island, right? 
and you have to cross the ocean of choice. You have to shift your perspective. And the island is antipode, right? This place where this alternative radical geographies could flourish. And just for fun, see what territories are uh, contiguous with the establishment. So here we have police state. Here we have greater cell, power sound, banal bay, trivial point, sea of repression, snug harbor, it means conformist, right? Grand territories and gerrymander peninsula. So as you guys can see, and if you're interested, you can look closely at this map, a lot of those things are very much well in life today. According to Jack, they kind of had to move towards oblivion at some point, while the future was with radical geography on this island, okay? So to conclude, I found it remarkable and exciting that Jack's academic legacy is being part of the newly written text, narrative about our discipline's history. Even despite the fact that he left academic work per se so long time ago. So Jack's contributions to our department have been enormous, even though he was not a member of our full-time faculty, okay? Me personally, I was glad to find a colleague close in spirit within our department. So when I moved my office a few years ago from one place to another within the department, right? This picture that I had on my door got lost. But today it's back on my door and it's gonna stay there. So thank you. That's remarkable. I did not know that. I've known Jack for 30 years. I had no idea about this. Thank you for letting us know. Um, uh, uh, Professor Ines uh, Miares, there you go. Hi, everyone. My, my experience with Jack is a little different because in terms of our research, the non-GIS side, we were kindred spirits. Um, he, he and I both in many ways were, you know, I would, came up old school where you can map it, but you don't know it until you went out and look at it. And he and I had conversations early on in my career, um, especially after I moved to Queens a year into my tenure at Hunter. And we talked about neighborhoods I should go explore that, you know, several of which I've had the privilege of um, publishing on and giving tours of. Uh, and then I had the, um, you know, I had, I didn't realize the breadth of Jack's influence until we were co-chairs together in the 2012 um, Local Arrangements Committee for the uh, New York uh, meeting that year of the Association of American Geographers. And, um, uh, when he was introduced, um, it was like, oh, wow, you know, he's, you know, he, I mean, I knew Jack as an adjunct, as a colleague, but the breadth of his influence um, was, uh, was a real eye opener to me um, as we uh, sat together in that committee. Um, and then I, you know, when he uh, chose to retire from Hunter, although he continued his field walks, I had the uh, daunting responsibility of taking over the geography of New York City class. Um, and I'm really glad I was trained up in a similar tradition because, you know, that class had always been and continues to be a field course about New York City. Yes, I do it differently than Jack does. And I had to also adapt keeping that perspective during COVID when I taught it. Um, but we still have students going out into neighborhoods 
and looking at them because there's only so much the map will tell you that you can create the best map in the world, but it won't tell you the signs. It won't tell you the infrastructure. It won't tell you how new immigrant groups are um, transforming the landscape in a pre-existing um, uh, infrastructure. Um, something that you know Jack did for his students, something that I continue to do for mine, and something that I hope my students will then do for theirs. And you know, in a way, to honor Jack, that I spent this morning um, a good part of the day doing. I'm working on a new project, and I was walking Fifth Avenue in Brooklyn um, and looking the at the incredible diversity that has emerged. Um, and you know, after walking um, about. 30 40 blocks of third and fourth avenue in brooklyn today I, you know i would have loved to have been able to sit down with jack and get his perspective on what i saw <clears throat> and um you know that's you know that's a tradition that i hope we carry on despite you know the emphasis and so many you know and so much of our uh, program on secondary data on mapping that we don't lose the importance of ground truthing of getting out there and seeing what you know the only way to really know a city is to go out and look at it and see what you know what the map what how what the map tells you looks like in reality and that's something that that i hope we all hold on to in in remembering jack thank you and now sean ahern professor sean ahern Thank you all. Um, really a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, you know, we're sort of mourning a loss, but we're also celebrating a life. And um, I first met Jack, um, actually, in a, there was a GIS steering committee that was developed under Mayor Giuliani um, in 1995. Jim Hall was on it, Al was on it, Wendy was on it, um, Jack was on it. And um, it was pretty remarkable. Uh, all the agencies got in the room and um, talked about what we need uh, in terms of data for the city. And um, Jack was a huge part of that because he had begun this organization of, of Gizmo. And um, I always felt like Gizmo was sort of like the Velvet Underground. And this, people are old enough in this room to know what I'm talking about. Um, where Jack was sort of like our, our Andy Warhol, and, and Al, was, <laughs> Al was our Lou Reed, and, and Wendy was our Nico, right? And, you know, it really was a subculture, and uh, it, it was people shared. Uh, and I think this was attributed, you know, leadership matters, right? We, we've seen that throughout the world. And Jack's leadership, I think... Um, stimulated, promoted this idea of sharing um, both our ideas, um, our work. Uh, it was really quite fabulous. Um, when I heard about his, his passing, actually, uh, Amy told me, we were in the hallway. Um, I was on the train home and I was thinking about times I'd spent with him. And um, you got to turn the clock back a little bit here. This was probably around 20. 2000, maybe, 99. And um, it, it was a newly formed group. I was in a meeting, Jack invited me, and it was a newly formed uh, group of real estate people, okay? And they tend to not be the latest with technology. And so we went around the room and each one would talk about how they would use GIS in real estate. And one would say, it would be a valuable tool for understanding technology and how it relates to real estate. Um, it will help us understand our properties. The geography will make our analysis better. And it went around the room like that, and it was clear after a while that everybody had kind of a funny sense of what GIS was and how it would impact real estate. And you heard this sigh coming across the room from Jack. And he says, no, no, no. Uh, geography isn't about things. It's about relationships. And GIS gives us a new powerful tool to understand and analyze those relationships in space and time. 
And all the real estate folks just kind of brightened up like, you know, they were newborn babies and heard something that they hadn't heard before. It was really quite sweet. And so that's what Jack did often. He would, he would come up with the essence of what we were really talking about. Um, another experience I had with him, which was really exciting and, and kind of mind blowing, was um, when Nice Map was first put together, it was the first high resolution digital orthophoto. When I say orthophoto, think map like image of the city of New York. And I was very familiar with it because uh, I worked with Al and, and Wendy um, and managed that the creation of that first base map. Um, and I think we flew the city in 96 and, and it took about three years to put it all together. So I sat down with Jack and um, we started perusing this and we spent about four hours doing so. And so um, let me see if I can find it. At the time, I was actually writing a book on mapping New York City, and so I recorded it. Um, and so uh, I just want to get this quote because it's kind of nice to hear Jack's voice. Here it is. Um, so we're talking, and, and Jack had this uh, ability to, um, to frame things at the conceptual level, really intellectual level. Um, and so this is what, so we're just sitting down and we're starting to look at, 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 the, at the images. And uh, this is what he says. He says, Jack's voice for us. There are three kinds of changes to the physical landscape. The first are those that affect the physical geography, like ge geologic processes, which aren't significant in people's lifetime, and man-induced changes, which are. Examples of these are the creation of Landfills like fresh kills, the sluicing down of hills and the creation of artificial islands. The second type of change is the infrastructure, housing, roads, subway lines, and factories. These last for a few generations. Some of the things I grew up with, some of them are disappearing. Railroad tracks torn down like Jamaica Avenue L, east of Supine Boulevard. Third, there's demographic-based stuff, which lasts anywhere from one generation to a number of years. The things that I think show up best on maps as remnants of former eras is the infrastructure, even when they're torn down. For instance, the Third Avenue L, what was that, 47 years ago? This is 1999, um, was torn down, but you can still see the remnants of it. On one side, on the west side, are the brownstones, and on the east side are the tenement buildings, where Donald Trump built his building. Um, and so I actually have a whole chapter of Jack and I sitting down and pouring over this map and him giving examples like that. You know, he'll look at, you know, we'll be in Brooklyn, we're cruising around the map, he'll be in Brooklyn and say, look, Sean, you see those little buildings behind the main building in Brooklyn? He said, what people did is to get extra income, they would build something in the back. And, you know, you can still see them in Brooklyn. You can see them in Queens because the law of 1878, I don't forget what it is exactly, uh, prohibited them in Queens and they had to be torn down. And so this was the kind of thing. And he went through all the, all the, all the different parts of the city. He looked at the densities and he had explanations for the changes in zoning, the period at which the density was built at that part of time. The, one of my favorite ones was, we were looking at this one area and there was kind of like uh, the adumbrations of a, 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 a feature that sort of was going throughout Queens, a, a, a major part of Queens. He says, you know what that is? That's the old Long Island Motor Speedway that Vanderbilt built. And then he had the whole story about how Vanderbilt was driving his cars in Newport, Rhode Island. And he got a ticket and he got fed up. So he went to Long Island. He bought a place in Long Island and first started with Jericho Turnpike. That didn't work out. So he built his own motorway. So you could actually still see the remnants. And so we perused the whole city. And I can't tell you how many examples he had, which were just mind blowing. And, and suddenly he just brought the whole thing to life and his knowledge base. And he had, he had multiple levels of knowledge. He had this sort of meta understanding of patterns and processes of urban development. 
but he also had the details of, of you know, the examples to go with it. So, you know, that's one of my fond, fondest memories, just because we spent like four hours together going through the map. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll all miss him. I think, uh, I think we all have a little piece of Jack, you know, that's special to us and, and that, that, you know, sustains his, his being, really. Thank you. So uh, I must say that I'll be taking home to my family the fact that Sean Ahern referred to me as Lou Reed, which <laughs> is a true emblem of. Uh, I'd like to now bring up from another community that Jack was a part of and helped form, I'm sure, uh, the Queens Historical Society, uh, Jason Antos, executive director. Aha, Jason. Hi. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. So I want to thank everybody for having this beautiful ceremony, this memorial service for Jack. Uh, I want to take a, a moment to tell you about how I met Jack Eichenbaum, Professor Eichenbaum, uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, in 2005, I had moved back to New York after attending the uh, University of Miami, where I had gotten a degree in communication. and. Uh, with the exception of the two years that I lived down south, it was my first time away from home. I'm born and raised in Whitestone, Queens, and so is my family. So we have been and dating back all the way to my grandparents who were born at uh, 280 Broom Street in the Lower East Side in 1912. So we've been in the city quite a long time. But at that time, after I had moved back to New York, uh, I had published a book on the history of Whitestone. And, uh, through this book, through this research, I came in contact with the Queens Historical Society. And as being only 23 years old, this was all new information to me. I didn't know there was a Queens Historical Society or a Bayside Historical Society. You know, the internet was still in its semi-infancy and trying to find this information and find its existence was difficult. And I remember coming to the Queens Historical Society where the staff there, showed me how to do research properly on history and how to look for photographs and go about my project. And they always told me, you really need to talk to Jack Eichenbaum. And so I waited and waited, and I knew that one day would come the opportunity where I would meet him. Now, being uh, in, a very, in my young 20s as I was, I was kind of nervous about meeting new people, uh, what type of impression would I make on the person? I knew virtually nobody involved in the Queen's history community, although I knew them by name. I knew of the famous uh, Stanley Kogan and Vincent Seyfried and Jack Eichenbaum, but I had never met any of them. And finally, one day in 2006, I saw online that there was going to be a walking tour of the famous um, Casino Corridor Park. And Casino Corridor Park is very significant in the history of Queens, I'll tell you in a second. So I contacted Queens Historical. I said, I'd love to go on this walking tour because the whole objective was to meet Jack Eichenbaum. And I got there and I remember it was in the middle of July and it was a sunny day and it was hot. And we all gathered there at the Casino Corridor Park and it was a, quite a large crowd. And um, met everybody there, the tour began and we, walked through the park and Jack was so descriptive of its history. And he explained to myself and everyone there uh, the significance of the Casino Corridor Park and why it's a corridor. And the reason being it's because it was part of the right of way for the private railroad line built by Alexander Stewart from Garden City. All right. And he had built this rail line to take people from Western Queens from Newtown which is today present day Elmhurst, out to Garden City. And the name of the train line was called the White Line because the cars of the train were painted white. And as you walk through Casino Corridor Park, if you look at it on a map from the air, you can see that it's a very distinct shape. It's like a swath that cuts its way across from west to east, okay, in a very deliberate manner. And that's because it follows the right of way of this old, of this ancient rail line from 1872, 1873. 
and he was pointing things out. And the thing that I enjoyed about it was I had never been on a historic walking tour. And the other thing that really uh, made me happy was that everything that he was saying, I already knew. <laughs> and, by, and this is significant because it, it, it validated me. You follow, it validated my research because at that time, 24, 25, I didn't know too many people in my age group and my peers who were into the same thing that I was. So I had really no one to talk to about this. I was kind of like alone in the research and the writing situation of preserving Queen's history. But to hear it from Jack Eichenbaum, I said, okay, I know that I wasn't wrong. And I said, man, I gotta meet him. I gotta find a good opportunity to get close to him and say hello and introduce myself. So we're walking along, maybe 30 people on this tour and I was all the way in the back of the line. And sooner or later, I started working my way up to the front, 20 people away, 15 people away. <laughs> 12 people away, five people away. And sooner or later, we came to a stop and he was pointing out things and people on the tour kind of fell back a little bit. People were taking pictures. This was still in the days where people were using digital cameras and 35 millimeter cameras as opposed to their smartphones to take pics. And uh, <laughs> I said, here's my opportunity. So I walked up to him and I said, uh, Mr. Eichenbaum, I said, uh, I'm Jason Antos and I want to say hello. And he looked at me and said, hello. I said, hi. <laughs> uh, I don't know why I was so nervous. And uh, I said, look, I, um, I want to say to introduce myself because uh, I wrote a book on the history of Whitestone. I'm currently doing another project. I just wanted to say hello. I just wanted to introduce myself to you. And that was it. And he, we spoke for a few seconds. And then he looked at me. He goes, you, you like researching Queen's history? I said, oh, very much so. He said, um, you know, this area is Fresh Meadows area. I said, yes. He goes, I bet you never guess what Fresh Meadows was called 100 years ago. And I said, yes, it was called Black Stump. And he looked at me and I went. <laughs> and, and he shook his head and he went, good. And then he kept walking. <laughs> and I said, Strike one. <laughs> We're not good. About a year later, maybe less, I was invited to come to the Queen's Historical Society, of which I was not even a member yet, and I wasn't a member, nor was I a docent, to go there to talk on the history of Whitestone and Flushing, etc. And we did a slideshow presentation, and Jack was in the front row, and I was talking for about, about an hour. And as I came Halfway into the, um, into the program, I spoke about the Throgs Neck Bridge. And I said, and I quote, the Throgs Neck Bridge was one, one of the last suspension bridges built in the city of New York. Not the last, but one of the last. But Jack didn't catch the one part. He thought I said the last. And he yelled out, wrong, <laughs> wrong. And I said, strike two. They had a strike too. I'm not doing too good. So, but that's okay. We had a good laugh about it later and I explained to him, I said, no, it, I know that it was one of, but not the last. And it was at this uh, very talk that he asked me to become a member of the Queens Historical Society. And I did that very day. I remember I became a member right there on the spot. Sooner I became a docent, a tour guide, and now at this point, I am executive director of the Queens Historical Society, but thanks to Jack, because he vouched for me. And um, I got to know him over the years. I went on additional tours with Jack, but an extraordinary thing, and this is in closing, uh, that I learned about Jack was, as most of you know, he was a very private person to, some, to a degree. And Jack lived in an apartment building across the street from where the Queens Historical Society is located. For those of you who do not know, we are located in the beautiful Weeping Beach Park, the Kingsland Homestead in downtown Flushing, behind the Bound House. Jack lived in a building, pre-war building off of Bound Street, and his apartment on the sixth floor overlooked the entire 
plaza where the Bound House and the Kingsland Homestead is located. So I knew that every morning when I would get to work, I was under the watchful eye <laughs> of the borough historian. And um, <clears throat> about a week ago, I went to see Jack's uh, family, uh, who you'll hear from later, of course, and they were very gracious in donating some of his uh, papers, some of his books to the Queens Historical Society where they will be put into our archive and uh, in his memory. But looking through these papers, um, I made an agreement with the family that if I found anything of a personal nature or notes from one of his tours and he was, you know, he, he was an obsessive note taker. I mean, he wrote down everything that if I found anything to this effect that I would pull it aside and give it back. And of course we separated everything and it'll be returned. I actually have it in my car because I thought I was going to see them tonight. But um, I found something very interesting. You see, you really don't know, sometimes you don't know someone in life and then you find out things about them after they're gone. And looking through these papers, I learned a lot about Jack Eichenbaum. I learned how Professor Eichenbaum, how he was uh, so um, passionate about preserving the history of Queens, but not only the ancient history, but also its current history. And by current history, I mean during the 1990s and early 2000s. For in this uh, collection, in these, uh, this treasure trove that his family had given us, I found that he had very um, obsessively detailed or collected details on the transitioning of Queens from a bedroom community to Manhattan to now an extension of the great metropolis. All right, Queens had gone through a similar transition in the 30s with the establishment of the airports and the expressways and the improvement of roadways, et cetera. But then it went through a second transformation, of course, that was in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Look at Long Island City, look at Astoria. Look at what will be coming soon to Willis Point City Field area. We, they just released the artist rendition last week at the town hall meeting. It's going to look like Long Island City in about five years. Get ready. So Jack uh, documented this in great detail. And I learned that in the 1990s, he was asked by many organizations, uh, business improvement groups, uh, local development coalitions to give tours to people. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know if they were private or not, but to give tours to show off the area to people who might be interested in coming to Queens to do business. And this is like in the 1990s. I actually found a brochure uh, dated from 1995 saying, come to Long Island City to do business. And it listed five amazing things that you'll see there. All right. And it shows you how they were really trying to sell it um, and how desolate part of the area was and how un, uh, you know urban it was. I remember this as a little kid. But I found a, um, a letter that I transcribed uh, because I didn't want to run the risk of losing the original one. So I kind of wrote it down. And this is from the dated uh, 1993 from the Queensbridge Plaza Development Corporation, which doesn't exist anymore because as if any of you know, Queensbridge Plaza is now fully developed <laughs> and the development is still in full swing. And it's very brief. And it's about a tour that he gave showing off Queensbridge Plaza to people interested in moving to the area, maybe doing business in the area. And this is over 30 years ago. And it briefly says, and you'll excuse me if I don't give the name of the person who wrote the letter because they wrote it in rather aggressive, cursive writing and I couldn't make out the name, but from the Queensbridge Plaza Development Corporation, Dear Jack, thank you for your walking tour of Long Island City. Your guided tour was so vivid that it can so easily picture in my mind's eye, the row of boats carrying those coffins across the East River to Calvary Cemetery to Queens in the dead of night. What vivid pictures you paint. From now on, whenever I travel around LIC, I will always see the neighborhood with new eyes. I thought that was very beautiful because it really tells the mission of the historian, of the preservationist, of the person who chronicles the history of a certain area and uh, shows you that this is the mission to bring that history to life in the best accurate way possible 
to inform, to educate people, and Jack did that so very well. And um, I'm going to miss him. I'm going to miss him at our board meetings. And um, that's all I wanted to share with you. And I thank you for having me here. Thank you. There must have been three or four Jacks operating simultaneously at the same time. I did not know. Uh, <laughs> it's so extensive. Um, OK, I'd like to now call up um, from another of Jack's communities, uh, Emma T.K. Guest Gonzalez, uh, or doctor, uh, who is uh, uh, from the Guides Association of uh, New York City. Good evening, everyone. My name is Emma Guest Gonzalez, and I'm recent past president of the Guides Association of New York City, also known as GANIC. GANIC is one of the largest and oldest professional tour guides associations in the world. It was founded in 1974, 50 years ago. And right at that time in the mid 70s, it was when Jack's first forays into being a tour guide, albeit unofficially took place as he, when he was teaching urban geography at the University of Seattle. He returned to Queens. He was working at the property division of the city's Department of Finance and continued to teach at Queens College and at Hunter College. His public walking tour started in 1982 and included Flushing, Long Island City, the changing cultures of Queens, and many others. Jack was always the first tour guide to come to mind when anyone would ask Gannick for Queens tours. He was infinitely generous with his knowledge and his time and became a mentor to several Gannick guides and not just those based in Queens. Jack joined Gannick in 2010 and was a proud member of our association. He attended meetings and events and he always welcomed Gannick guides on his tours. During the COVID lockdown, Jack was featured with the other borough historians at um, our on an online meeting. It was on November 4th in 2020 and you can see this meeting is recorded and it can be watched on our YouTube channel if anyone wants to um, see Jack and have, I'm here speaking one more time. And one of the dis topics of discussion that came up was um, speaking about a history of each of the five boroughs. And Jack spoke up immediately and made the excellent point that we can have only have a better understanding of New York City when we understand um, the interaction between the boroughs, how each one relates to each other, and how those relationships and connections are part and parcel of the vibrancy of New York. Now, for those of you who are not tour guides, one of the best parts of being a tour guide is what we call a FAM tour, a film familiarization tour. And um, those are when guides give tours to other tour guides. And Jack's FAMs for Gannick included the ecology of Penn, of Penn Station and daylight loft buildings in Long Island City. And both were sold out. They were excellent occasions for Gannick members to learn from the very best. As we just heard from Jason, um, Jack was an active member of the Queens Historical Society. He participated in many of their um, events with other Gannett guides. Um, Jack was especially close um, with Queens resident and Gannett guide Yue, uh, Wang Yue, who's, who calls and still calls Jack his teacher, and other Gannett guides, Sue Katz, Nina Mende, Linda, Linda Fisher, John Semlack, Mark Landman, and other members, some of whom are here tonight with us in this room, and others who are online. And we all remember him with great fondness. I had the good fortune of we working very briefly with Jack in 2018 at the Theodore Roosevelt Public Speaking Contest at the Theodore Roosevelt House on 20th Street. And we were on a panel together judging the speeches of a group of talented high school students. I had met him already through Gannick, but we had not met, spent much time together one on one. When I sat next to him and introduced myself, he grilled me gently for a few minutes testing my background as a New York City guide and my credentials to be on the panel with him and the other judges. Fortunately, I passed muster and he began to tell me stories of his walking tours and his experience as a guide. I will never forget his uh, rather strong opinions about which students should come out on top. I mean, it took us a very long time to decide because neither of us were about to budge. But in the end, we had a lovely morning together and I'm thankful to have that memory with Jack. Now, as a professional tour guide, I think the best way to remember Jack's contribution to tour guides and, the, and tour guiding in New York City is to quote his own words and to share with you his standards for giving walking tours. 
And I quote, a good walking tour encourages appreciation of the city in some way. It is rich in visual experiences, stressing perspectives not seen from a vehicle. Concise commentary is given at uncongested, uh, at uncongested vantage points with, no, with low noise levels. This is often a challenge. In-depth questions from individuals can be addressed while walking. The starting and finishing point should be accessible by public transportation. Those planning to come by automobile may require where best to park, particularly if the route is not circular. A thoughtful leader will try to arrange for pleasant weather, a snack and restrooms and stop en route. In the event of thoughtless leadership or more likely uncooperative nature and cityscapes, backpacks are encouraged. And the tour guides in the audience, I know these are, these are words of wisdom. Now for Jack, a walking tour is much more than a walk with commentary. It was a way to experience a city or a location, as he said, in response to our different natural settings, whether they are bays, rivers, plains, highlands, or glacial moraine. Um, as transportation technology and cultural migrations change our skills, habits, and economic status. This is the only way we can understand a city or a space. And for Jack, the real New York City was, cannot be seen from inside a vehicle or from a cell phone screen. And he reminds us all that we should interact with it. Be sure to venture beyond popular tourist attractions. And these are words I think we could, can and should live by as we continue our work as ambassadors of the city and you yourselves as you go around New York. So on behalf of the GANIC board, on all, behalf of all GANIC members, I would like to express our most sincere condolences to Jack's family and to his friends. May his memory be a blessing. Thank you. Um, I'd just uh, like to bring up uh, Beth Lowe, um, uh, who is, uh, I think, Jack's niece. Um, and. Am I, am I correct, right? Uh, cousin. cousin, okay. Um, and uh, you have, uh, I guess, are you going to present from uh, the laptop or Amy? Okay, Amy knows, I don't. Mic is on. The mic is on. Mic two. Okay. And then um, her slides. Oh, I didn't. Okay. Thank you. Hi, hi everybody. Um, we didn't have a very large family, um, so I just wanted to mention. Uh, Jack is basically, um, except for my sister, my last relative. And um, this is uh, the, the photos that I could gather from his apartment. Um, I just moved myself. We do have more photos, but unfortunately mine are still in storage and it was just hard to access them. So these are all from his personal photo collection. Um, there were a lot, but there were not all labeled so i you know i put together what i could you're going to see a lot of pictures of jack <laughs> so um but i'm going to start out with uh, some family history here um so, okay. okay oh so <laughs> even though this is a squirrel and it's a cute squirrel uh we we put it in there because does everybody know when jack's birthday was yeah, yeah, Groundhog's Day. So this was the closest that we had to Groundhog. <laughs> and so this is Jack's family. Um, that's him on the left uh, as a little boy. That's his mother in the middle. I don't know who the person in the stroller, stroller is. I believe that's his grandfather. It could be his father. I can't really tell from this picture. And I don't know who the lady on the right is. It could be an aunt. Um, um, unfortunately, while he kept meticulous notes on other things, um, 
Not sure. Th- I, I have found some stuff about family history, but he did not label the black and white photos, and I'm a little, I'm still a little fuzzy on the details um, of some of it. So this is his mother on the left as a little girl. Her name was Gertrude. Um, she had very very red hair, <laughs> and um, they were from Poland. Um, Sandomierz, if I'm saying the name of the town correctly. Um, that was the uh, town of origin in Poland. That's uh, her parents. So that's Jack's grandparents, I believe. Um, her name was Rose, and his name was Abraham. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not Abraham. His name was Elias. And um, while I was looking through and um, some th- uh, papers of Jack's, I did find something that he wrote about his grandfather, which I didn't know before. Um, his grandfather Elias apparently um, played a very big role in Jack's life. Um, he lived in the household when he was growing up, and he said um, when he was 19, um, he passed, and he it had a big uh, effect on him on him he said it was even uh, worse than when his own parents died um, so he was a big part of his life and he basically was his best friend so that's them that's rose that's my grandfather um saul um who is jack's uncle and that's gertrude his sister um, they came over, by the way, before World War II, so obviously they escaped anything they need to be escaped. Um, which was, this is Rose again. I believe this is Gertrude, yes, this is his mother. Um, I'm not sure what the occasion is, but... And this is I'm grabbing, and this is Rose again. And I'm not sure if anybody can read that. Let me know. <laughs> is that the year? Is it 1915? I, I'm not sure. Um, okay, so this looks like um, that's Jack as a little boy, and I believe that's his father. Um, I'm not sure what the uniform is. It could be military he did not talk about his father too much to us um i know that the relationship wasn't the best so um and this is rose's family i don't know the name of any of these people and i'm sorry <laughs> but it was a good photograph so <laughs> good mustache on the left you know <laughs> Uh, this is his mom and him as a baby, so that's cute. You know, my aunt, I, aunt, I called her Aunt Gertie, and she had a very distinctive voice. <laughs> she 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 sounded almost like a little um like, she, like I have to say it, she was kind of like a muppet. She sounded like a muppet. <laughs> you always knew it was her when she was on the phone. <laughs> okay, so my fiance restored this picture. Um, This is a class picture taken, I believe believe it's in New York, it could be in Poland, and that's Jack's father sitting right in the front over here. That's why their eyes look a little strange though, the restoration. Um, So I believe this is the grandfather, uh, his grandfather Elias, and Jack as a baby. Uh, He obviously, he he was very blonde. (laughs) I never met... uh, his father if i did it was very young and that's him and um gertrude my aunt grady i believe she lived in the forest hills elmhurst area anybody knows any different um let me know i'm pretty sure that's where it was now that's him and i don't know who the baby is he must have had this isn't this must have been somebody that we saw maybe one of gertrude's uh not Gertrude's, maybe his father's relatives, because I he never talked about them and I never met them. If I did, I said like it was before I remember anything about it. I don't know who that is. <laughs> He's in there. Another V picture. 
this is them. Um, this is Jack as a baby and my Aunt Gertie. And that's uh, Jack's father. And that's Jack. And I definitely see the resemblance. Um, when they, There's one picture you're going to see later where they, they look very much alike, and not so much in that one. And there he is in his little cute boots. <laughs> And I love that one. <laughs> Adorable. <laughs> there we go. And that's his bar mitzvah picture. And um, after my grandfather passed on my mom's side, because um, this is the Jewish side of my family, and Jack would lead our satyrs because he also was the only person that left that could read the Hebrew prayers. So he always led the Passover seder. My aunt also took over some of the duties, but he could still read everything in Hebrew. And that's another shot. And now we've transitioned <laughs> to, yeah, young adulthood. Uh, I don't know what to call this era. <laughs> this, this is this is like a surprising picture, but I, I call this like his Simon and Garfunkel era. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, so I believe that's his father over here on the right, and then his grandfather on the left. Oh, sorry, that went too fast. Hold on, let's go back. Ah! I lost Amy. I messed, I messed it up. <laughs> I lost it. Ah, <laughs> uh, there we go. Okay, so the the picture with the skis, he's in Switzerland, I believe. So as far as, uh, okay, let me, I, there we go. Okay, so this, uh, I believe this was Jack, uh, maybe early 20s. He, he was teaching overseas in Switzerland in a boarding school. Um, so I believe that that's where this is and with the skis. Uh, I think he only did that for about a year or two though, but um, this was probably, you know. What did you say? Matterhorn? Oh, oh Matterhorn. Yeah. Oh, wow. How did you know that? <laughs> I didn't know he knew how to ski. <laughs> this is a very nice uh, Saturday Night Fever shot. I love that. Love the shirt. <laughs> um, this is obviously like, you know, I think this might have been again over overseas pictures. And this one was a surprise because Jack was never a smoker. So I don't know what's in his hands and I would never experienced him ever as a smoker. <laughs> so this is like the younger side. I mean, I know it was the seventies and everybody smoked. So maybe, maybe that's why. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> that wasn't really his thing though. He'd have a cold beer once in a while, but or maybe drinks, but I don't, I don't remember him ever being mentioning that, but you never know. Right. So this is when he uh, went to Israel and he was living on a kibbutz for a while, but a lot of people here didn't know he did that. Um, so he helped on the farm. I don't know how long he was there, but this is definitely a shot from that time period. And this is me in the 90s. <laughs> you see how the large glasses came back around? Um, <laughs> and that's, uh, that's Jack, that's our family living room. So he must have been at our house for a holiday. My parents used to host Thanksgiving. Um, he would also come to Christmas. Um, we, had, we had a double-sided, you know, multiple holidays. <laughs> And this picture is at his apartment, the one our uh, Jason described earlier. Um, he used to host Hanukkah, and that's my sister 
lighting the menorah. My sister's name is Amy, and she's on the Zoom watching. That's my aunt, uh, Robin, who's his first cousin. Um, and that's Jack back there. And that's us, yeah, doing our Hanukkah. I believe this is uh, midnight news about. It's nice to find a picture of it because there. I don't think we, have, I personally have any. Um, so this is again, this is Jack's uh, very close friend, Jerry on the right. I'm sure some of you have met him. Um, Jerry, unfortunately, is not well enough to, I think, even attend by Zoom. That's my father in the middle who passed uh, in 2021. And that's my aunt and my singing songs, which she loved to do. Um, she also passed in 2021. Jack and my aunt Robin were very, very close. Um, I would call it more of like a brother sister relationship than a first cousin relationship. Um, they always, you know, they grew up together. They, she came to, I'm sure you, many of you have met her at his birthday parties if you came to them. Um, she cared for him. Even when she was sick, she would uh, call him and look in on him, especially uh, I think in 2020. She was the one that got him uh, some help initially. And this is a nice picture. So that is his mother on the right. And I believe this is our family friend, uh, Helen, who was a friend of everybody's family, but I'm not absolutely certain that's the case. But I, I think this is a nice picture. And, um, Jack and his mom were, were close and she was very supportive. He told me. Uh, this is everybody opening gifts. That's my mother on the chair. You'll see a better picture of her later. And uh, that's my aunt's uh, son on the floor. And he, you know, he, even though he wasn't, I, I don't, he wasn't big on gifts, he still gave them. And the, I don't know why this is in black and white, but it is. This is the same Hanukkah celebration in his apartment and this is um a photo of my side the family who jack was close with so that's my grandfather who's um jack's uncle so his name is saul that's my mother on the left so my mother and my aunt robin who are his first cousins and my grandmother on the far left um, her name was doris and everybody was close, and my my parents lived in Little Neck for a long time, um, and his parents, uh, my mom grew up in Bayside. Um, they lived in Bayside. My father grew up in Forest Hills, so everybody lived and knew each other in Queens. Um, this is Jack at my house again for my grandfather's surprise birthday party, and that's my grandmother, and that's my aunt's husband, Gordon. Um, so that was a nice day. I remember that. And that's my grandparents again, my Aunt Robin, just to get a good picture of them. Um, I, I think my grandfather looks a lot like um, Jack and his father. You can see the resemblance. And that's, that's everybody, and they're all gone. So, it's, you know. But um, my, my mother and my aunt were, were like sisters to Jack. That's my father again. And uh, this was a, yeah. <laughs> and, and this is a picture I was saying that Jack looks a lot like his father in this one. I can't really see it there. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, I don't know what the occasion was, but yeah. Yeah, it's a nice, nice, nice ensemble, I have to say. <laughs> And I think this is his father. And I don't know if that's, I don't know who the little girl is, honestly. I was thinking that it might, I, I don't, I'm just not sure. So she's cute though. Oh, I don't know why that segue to that. That was a weird, okay. That, that's out of Amy. That was out of sequence though. That was a weird, okay. Uh, this is a sad picture. So this is a picture of when um, Jack was hospitalized in 2020 after he deteriorated, um, especially mental health wise. And um, this was 
unfortunately the pandemic restrictions prevented you know visiting they had him behind glass and it was very very restrictive um, that's his friend jay there who helped facilitate and get him into um, another facility so he could rebuild um, his strength because he um, i think just spent a long time not eating and staying in bed for a while there this is another picture uh, from fairly recently um, so I think this is uh, the visitors that everybody was talking about. Thank, thanks to everybody that did come and visit him when he was struggling. And this was after he broke his foot. Uh, this is his friend Howard, who flew in from Seattle to visit him all the way in Belmore, Long Island. So. <laughs> And this was, somebody just told me where this was, Costa Rica, that they said that this is. I don't know. Oh, I can, what happened to the, the, the other ones? They're gonna go, oh, okay. I was surprised those two were in the house. Sorry, guys. There should be a lot more pictures of him on. I'm confused what happened. What happened to the rest of them? Um, it, thank you so much. <laughs> Those young pictures of him. Um, I mean, it, he really did leave high lives. We should have had this this event 20 years ago. So while he was still around, you know, we could have really known him in, in five or six dimensions that he, that he lived his life. It's astonishing. Um, so at, at this point in time, as an opportunity for anyone here who wants to come to the podium and speak for a minute or two, um, uh, some remembrance or some something uh, that you might want to say. So if you can come up. Yes. Okay, get her the uh, microphone. Do you want to come up or you'll wait for the microphone? Anyone who wants to come up can form a line over here. Right. We're going to take um, anyone who wants to speak in person first and then switch into the Zoom people who want to speak. So if you want to speak in person, please line up over here. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Rachel Donner. I have known Jack for a very long time. Uh, I assume we met on a, a hike, on a walk. I was interested in uh, Queen's history. Um, in fact, later on, and we liked eating, and we often traveled together. And so I thought, um, I didn't travel then, but one of his first jobs was teaching in Switzerland. So it's possible that came from that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, another thing we both liked, uh, you know, we went to Vietnam, we went to uh, China, uh, we went to places in South America, things like that together. Um, we also both like swimming. Uh, so if we were with a group, sometimes we were the only two people who went into the pool, <laughs> which we liked. Um, it was a good guy. And as I say, we traveled together very often. And at the end, uh, he came back and he told me in December, he told me um, he'd had a great time because he had a time a hard time in the last few years. Um, and he'd really gone, uh, and then he'd gone on a ship with some friends, and but he was tired from the trip and he would call me next week and we'd get together. And that was the end. But he really, he really, as you can see, all these activities he was with, he, he got me to uh, edit the, the, uh, the queens, the queens, the, in the 
when he wrote something for the ma magazine, for the Queen's Historical Society, he talked me into being the editor, <laughs> which was fine for a while. Um, but then, then I got fired because somebody came on the committee and he, he had been a journalist, so I lost my job. <laughs> anyway, um, okay. My name is Jim Piazza, and I am an improvisational representative for about 200 people that knew Jack, who probably you would not know, and we're all Scrabble players. And uh, Jack uh, was the sweetest guy in the world until his inner Scrabble came out. <laughs> and I wouldn't say armed and dangerous, he was disarming and dangerous. He would give you a big hug, you'd sit down, and he would try to kill you <laughs> with words. And the mystery of Jack is amazing after today because for me, Gizmo is just a good Scrabble find. I mean, I had no idea about the length and breadth of his life and his accomplishments, and I'm so impressed. And I love knowing him. And uh, he did not suffer fools in Scrabble, and I was one of the fools that he suffered. Uh, and I so appreciate him, and he was a great uh, mentor and a great yeller. And I never took his yelling seriously because he was adorable. Anyway, this is from the Scrabble Club. so. Hi, Jack. Hi. Hi. It's an honor to be here, and it's an honor to remember Jack. Uh, this is a this is a ceremony of layers. We're learning all about the layers of Jack, and I'm going to bring another layer into the mix, uh, and that is Jack as as a Queensborough historian. My name is Michael Michonne, and I am the former Manhattan borough historian. And uh, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you how Jack Eichenbaum became Queen's borough historian, because I was there at the moment. Um, so to set the scene a little bit, uh, borough historian is a very mysterious position. So let me tell you how it, what it's all about. Um, by the way, it's a legally mandated position. The state law requires every municipality in New York State to have a public historian. It specifies that in the city of New York, there not be a city historian, there be five borough historians. And it prescribes that they are appointed, appointed by the respective borough presidents. And so I became Manhattan borough historian. Uh, in 19, uh, uh, 1996, no, what that, no, 2006, excuse me, 2006. Um, and just so you know that there is a, it's kind of a dark humor for this ceremony, but it's often said that borough historians leave their position feet first, right? <laughs> uh, but, but that was not the case with me. Uh, my predecessor, uh, resigned the position, and then I took over the position at his recommendation. And in in my early tenure as Manhattan Borough Historian, uh, I had the dubious opportunity to help fill two other borough historian positions. It turns out that shortly after I got in, the Staten Island Borough Historian passed away. and. The borough historian position is one that's very, very obscure within the structure of the borough president's office. And I suspected that the borough president didn't even know that there was a vacancy in the borough historian's <laughs> office. So representing the forgotten borough of Manhattan, I decided to make them aware of this. And I contacted the borough president's office and say, hey, I don't know if you know this, but you got a vacancy there and you might want to fill it. And they thanked me profusely and went about filling the position of Staten Island Borough Historian. Turns out that shortly thereafter, the same situation arose with Queens. Uh, the, the then Queens Borough Historian, Stanley Cogan, became incapacitated. Basically, he, was, he, he wasn't able to fulfill his duties. He was institutionalized. And so took it upon myself again to get in touch with the Queens Borough President's office and say, by the way, you have a vacancy in their position because the current historian there is no longer really able to fulfill the duties and you might want to go around and find yourself a new borough historian and so they thanked me profusely and then they said well we're going to have a search committee 
to find a new Queensborough historian. And we want you to be on the search committee. And so I accepted the position. There were about four or five of us. And uh, needless to say, I was the only non-Queens resident on the search committee. Uh, so I felt very honored. And so a solicitation went out from the borough president's office and we got back a handful somewhere, I don't know, not as many as 10, but certainly more than just a couple of resumes and applications to become the Queensborough historian. And uh, it was a motley assortment. It was a motley assortment. And of course, Jack was among the, the applicants. And uh, I'll tell you right now, I, I, I'll be very candid. I won't name names, but Jack was not the most qualified applicant for the position. He was not. But I got to tell you, Jack impressed us mightily with his heart, his spirit, his devotion, his love, his affection for his burrow and for people. You could tell instantly Jack was a people person, right? And that was such a winning qualification. It just, it, it swept it swept the balloting. Uh, and when it came time to make a recommendation, we were unanimous in our choice of Jack Eichenbaum as Queensborough historian. Um, happy to say that the borough president took our recommendation and appointed Jack. Um, now you would think, now that so now we have a full assortment. We've got five borough historians, right? Uh, every borough is represented. And you would think that the borough historians are pretty kind of, you know, quiet, bunch. Uh, and by the way, just to give you some sense of the demographics involved, they called me the kid. I'm celebrating my 65th birthday uh, in just a week from now, and they called me the kid, right? And so, uh, but you would think we'd be very demure and very, oh no, we were an opinionated, argumentative bunch. <laughs> we would occasionally get together. We try to do it just as a pro forma thing. And I got a, the sense that it was a kind of a reluctant thing because there were a lot of heated discussions. But Jack was always kind of the peacemaker. And he always managed to sort of soothe things in his like his big picture way. And whenever emotions ran hot, he would always kind of tamp us down. Anyway, so he became absolutely my favorite. And I think he had an affection for me as well. I didn't. I was too close to his age to be considered his son, but I very much considered him my older brother. And I think he considered me his kind of younger brother as well. Uh, and and I, I'm happy to say that uh, my time among the borough historians were made so much better, so much bearable because of Jack. Now, eventually I was, removed from my position, uh, but I stayed in touch with Jack and um, he came to some ceremonies I held, things like that. He was, it was always a pleasure to see him. I once ran into him on the line for a movie. Um, but of course I got to experience a little bit of Jack during his dark period that, that's been referred to here. And it broke my heart to see him in that condition. And I did what little I could to boost him out of it. I visited him in Queens, from Manhattan, that's a trip, uh, to, to make him feel better, lift his spirits, give him some, some hope and some, you know, some reason for, for going on. And I shared with him my friendship and my affection. And I'm happy to say, I also got to experience him in person when he came out of the dark period. In fact, I spent some time with my colleague here, Emma, who spoke earlier. She and I uh, spent some time with them at our workplace. We work at the observatory on top of the uh, World Trade Center, One World Trade Center. And I invited him up so he could look at the whole city around him from a different perspective, right? Usually he's on the ground with the tour guides, but we brought him up into the sky. And it was just so great to spend time with him. I'm so happy he came out of that dark time. Uh, and he got to experience life again. Uh, I will miss him. I love the man. And uh, like I said, he is the big brother, uh, my second big brother. I had a real big brother as well, but my second big brother in, in my heart as, as, um, as affectionately as my real one. So uh, rest in peace, Jack.
I think Jack was also my favorite borough president. And I, I, as far as I know, I don't think anyone has reappointed uh, a new Queens borough president. I, probably because. Sorry. sorry? Queens borough is snorting. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I don't think anyone can really re replace Jack. Um, my name is John Cho. I'm the executive director of the Greater Flushing Chamber of Commerce. And um, I, I know Jack uh, as an activist, as a neighborhood activist. Um, I live in, in Flushing. And uh, uh, when I first got active in Flushing um, in 1996, you know, uh, Jack was one of the people who welcomed me and people like me to this community. And it was really important because that year, um, the, the, the then uh, Council member um, Julia Harrison told the New York Times that the Asian immigrants coming into Flushing were like robbers and thieves, and that were coming to conquer and invade the neighborhood. And it was uh, a time of tension and conflict. Um, politicians, like today, are using immigration as a as a way of dividing people and um, gaining power. And um, I think Jack represented to me. Um, someone who is willing to bring people together. And uh, he and I and other people in the community um, formed a project called One Flushing to really bring together all the different cultural communities in Flushing to work together uh, for jobs, uh, for housing. Um, we worked on a number of projects. Um, you know, if you walk on uh, 39th Avenue in, in downtown Flushing, you'll see trees. And those are trees that Jack and I worked on for years to get planted. Um, if, you, if you go to uh, the 7 train, um, the subway station that has new entrances, um, millions of dollars are now in, being spent to upgrade the subway station and the LIR station there. And, and, uh, and Jack was a, a, a huge part of that, um, really advocating for the community. Um, the other project that I want to point out is um, he really felt as a pedestrian and a, as someone who um, was a senior citizen that it was really important to have safe streets and sidewalks. And he and I would go to the police station, the 109th precinct, and ask uh, very kindly, uh, politely, uh, please do not park your personal cars on our sidewalks. And we would, uh, you know, we spent years arguing with the precinct commander and his staff who, you know, actually met with us once and said, it's a matter of national security that our police officers can get to park their personal cars on the sidewalks there. And um, last year, they finally got rid of those cars. And that um, is really Jack's legacy uh, for me um, in, in, as a resident of Flushing to be able to walk safely on the sidewalk, which seems like a small thing, but it's not. Um, it means a great deal for people there. Um, I, I have noticed, though, that there's been some backsliding, and they've started <laughs> to uh, park their cars on the sidewalk again. And I wanted to propose, you know, one way that we honor people in New York City is to co-name streets. So I, I would like to propose, uh, I think Jack would be tickled, um, having his name on the corner of Union and 37th Avenue, right uh, at the, the 109th Precinct, to, uh, as a warning and as, uh, you know, um, to the police officers, do not park your, your cars on, on, our, on our sidewalks. So thank you so much. Um, if there's no one else, do you want to say something? Oh, then please come up. Um, I have known Jack Ackenbaum for many, many years. I met him at uh, a Scrabble Club in the early 60s and have been friends with him ever since. Um, I used to have a Christmas party every year and uh, he would come until the last couple of years. He wasn't able to get there because he said he needed um, the only way he could get there is if I had a friend who could drive to pick him up. And I'm a non-driver, but I'm just a walker. So um, 
he reached, he worked for the city and so did I. Um, and he, I worked in the, um, the bridges area and he worked in the finance area uh, for some time, uh, not quite as long as I have, but um, um, he retired from the city. Um, I finally retired at 85 in September of this year. So I have been kept keeping in touch with him over the years. And I also enjoy tennis matches and I would stop to visit him many times each year going to the tennis matches. And we uh, had many, many conversations and uh, he was one of the nicest persons that I've ever encountered. And um, I'm surprised that um, some of his other friends are not here at this point. But um, I know a friend is listening in Florida by, and uh, is, is one of his good friends. And uh, they used to take a lot of trips together. And um, I know that we will both miss him for quite a while. I, I um, am delighted that uh, I was able to meet him in the 60s. And we've been friends ever since. Uh, good evening. My name is Lee Ilan. I, um, I work on brownfields for the city, contaminated properties that don't get redeveloped unless uh, they get cleaned up. And uh, I was pretty new working in this, and I think I had taken one GIS class so I could, you know, add a little bit of data to a map and heard about Gizmo and went to a meeting where Jack was there presiding at the beginning and inviting all, he'd always start the meetings this way, invite any new person to come and introduce themselves. And even though I knew next to nothing, it was like, oh, we're glad you're here and we're interested to hear from you. And, you know, it didn't matter how much or little you knew. Um, he just made everybody feel welcome and part of the community and it, you know, kept me going back, even though I never took more than that one GIS class, but I got it of why it was important. Um, and, you know, maps and data and sharing information and building a community and was uh, really grateful for his um, welcoming and introducing and and keeping it going. And uh, then later on, as uh, the city actually established its own Brownfields office, um, I don't even remember how I did this, but there was one year I like, you know, had a few hundred bucks for like staff training. And in addition to like getting somebody to come in and teach us how to take pictures of our sites, um, Jack had said he had, you know, knowledge of the, the background and how the city developed in areas we had a lot of uh, contaminated properties and a lot of projects there. So, um, able to get my whole office together and he led us on a walking tour of Greenpoint over the Newtown Creek to Long Island City and telling us about the history of development uh, there and uh, it was really wonderful to be able to allow him to share his knowledge to um, you know to more people in that urban geography and history sense so I'm very grateful for everything he taught me and for the legacy he's left as we can see by all the people and organizations and jack thank you for all the beautiful things you've done okay um i think we'll we're if no with no one else left here in the audience we will go to those online and uh, Jan Westwater, uh, can you speak? Can you unmute? No, no, we can't hear you, Jan. Uh, you have to unmute. I, I know. I, I know. Okay. Jack, okay, you can. Jack and I taught school together at Lazan American School in 1965, 
And Jack and my husband were the science department. Jack taught chemistry, John taught math and physics, and I was the English department. And the, mem the, the mountains you saw in the picture are the Dawn du Midi. And we would wake up in the morning and there would be a layer of fog and clouds in the valley called the Mer de Nuage. And you could walk over the layer of clouds to get to school. And um, the school was at the upper end of the village. And I remember nights when we would get on sleds and, and slide down the hill, down to the bottom of the village where there was a pub where you could get raclette and beer or wine. And so we do that and then finally pull our sleds back up the hill before we'd go to bed at night. And at the end of that year, we took a sailing trip to the Greek islands with a friend of his, Richard Carpel, and my sister and a friend of hers, and had this in, uh, rented a, a yacht in Greece, and which was crewed, and for two weeks sa sailed among the Cyclades. And then let, we kind of lost touch with Jack, although he went to England. And at that point, he got in touch with my husband's parents who lived in England. So uh, he was always connecting. Um, and that was one of the things I loved about him. And then we kind of lost touch with him. And later he cut, turned back in, up in our lives in Seattle where my husband was a professor in the math department and Jack was in uh, the geography department. And we got to know each other better over the years that he was there and in different ways because by then we had three little kids. And then he um, got back in touch with us years later after he left Seattle. And um, from about 2010, we've been in pretty good contact, regular contact with each other. And just last October, I was really thrilled that I had the chance to go to New York. And I tell my daughter, we've got to go see Jack. That's one thing that is absolutely we've got to do while we're there. And so she um, got us out to Jack's and we had this wonderful time, got to see Richard, whom I had not seen since the Greek sailing trip. And he brought some pictures and Jack took us for a great Chinese lunch. And we were just so thrilled that uh, it was this wonderful afternoon together. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have another hand. I see uh, David Johnson. Uh, unmute, please. Did you unmute? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm David. I'm here with my uh, partner, Howard, in Portland, Oregon. I met uh, Jack over 50 years ago. He was teaching at the University of Washington, who was a new young professor, and I was one of his students. We both were specializing in urban geography. Then, as chance would have it, we met at a downtown bar and discovered we had even more in common. Then we kept in touch with each other. We went to geography conventions. We found out we both had a love of tournament scrabble and we were able to enjoy that. We both loved travel. We took a vacation, a week long vacation to Jamaica together. Traveling with Jack was an adventure. <laughs> We had to go by local bus from place to place. He wanted to get to know and meet the local people. He wanted to be able to assess the, all the geography of the island. And we, we really did have a great time. Um, after I retired, I moved to Portland and he came out to visit, I would say, maybe seven or eight times. He usually timed it with the annual Portland Scrabble Tournament over Labor Day. And we had the opportunity to go visit him in New York. And I have a couple of favorite memories. We walked, across, walked together across the Brooklyn Bridge at sunset <laughs> and 
most of you know, he loved doing walking tours. Another memory is that he took us on a walking tour of Queens. And we stopped, we had uh, dinner at an Argentinian restaurant. And we got to stop and look at a plaque. Oh, yeah. And it was a plaque honoring Alfred Butts, the creator of Scrabble. <laughs> anyway, we had so many experiences together over 50 years. We had a lot in common to sustain the friendship and he will be missed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now we have uh, Allison Humphrey and Judith Stamp. Go ahead, unmute and speak. Yeah, I'm muted now. You're... Hi, I'm Judith Stamp and I'm Allison's mom. And um, Jack and I met at the University of Toronto. Michigan. Uh, sorry, <laughs> University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And um, when um, I was trying to play Superwoman and do my my PhD at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and and I was having Allison and my and my son a couple of years, a few years later, and uh, so all of that we um, had a uh, a pretty amazing um, early time. And um, Jack became I I asked Jack to be Allison's godfather. And so this is goddaughter Allison, and uh, I will pass it over to her in a minute. But just wanted to sort of say that uh, it was very special that we had stayed in touch and that we went down to um, Jack's home in uh, Brooklyn. In and, Queens. And, oh, <laughs> I've got memory issues now. This is sort of, I'm glad I've got Allison here to to help straighten me out. But it was very, very special um, visit down there, and uh, and um, Alison, I'll pass over to her to to tell a little bit about that. But um, it was very special to have this long, long connection with with Jack over the over the decades, and to have her to have him as her godfather. So. Alison, do you want to say something? Too? Yeah, well, I, I want to say thank you to everybody who has um, been speaking today because um, it's it's strange how we all see people like the um, the folks checking out the elephant from different angles, and and uh, I I didn't know how lucky I was uh, to have uh, Jack as a godfather. Obviously, I did, but um, to hear all of your stories about uh, what what a gift he was uh, to the world in so many different ways. Um, uh, one of the my favorite uh, moments was when he came to visit us in Toronto and took us to learn about the best Chinese restaurants in Toronto. He came <laughs> to our town and taught us about our own town. Um, so that was beautiful, and uh, I was very, very uh, lucky to be able to to visit him a couple of times, three times over the last uh, decade, and to visit him just this past summer when he could. You know, it was very hard for him to walk, but he still insisted on taking me to a Chinese restaurant and having soup dumplings, and uh, it was uh, just an honor to see the world um, at street level through his eyes. Um, and and he taught me so much about living um, in the world and in connection with the world. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is there anyone else with their uh, hand up at this point? Oh. Uh, 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 okay. I, and also Clark uh, Akatif. Yes, I'm so happy to be able to add a few words here. I'm Clark Ackett, if I'm speaking from my home in Palo Alto, California. And I first met, I, I, I am one of the ancients of radical geography. I was a uh, professor, assistant professor at Michigan State while Jack and, uh, and uh, Judith were students at Michigan. And there was a great event that took place in 1969, which was really the birth of radical geography. It happened at Ann Arbor, where the AAG decided to meet. They were going to meet in Chicago, 
But if you remember the great riot in Chicago over the, the, with the Yippies and such, and because of that, the, a group of geographers got together and said we could not go to Chicago for our meetings. We had to go somewhere else. And Ann Arbor raised their hand, and that's where it was. And Jack organized a panel of social scientists that he knew of, and they were one of the plenaries. But I was also involved with the wild Bill Bungie, the notorious communist geographer of the time from Wayne State. And so as they were starting their proceeding, I spoke from the floor. And roundly, I said, this is no time for academics. This is a time for radical action. And William Bungie and a large component of black students from Fitzgerald neighborhood where he lived took the stage in a militant show of, of obstreperousness. And that began this whole movement. And now I've only seen Jack a few times through my years. I got a job here back in my hometown at San Jose State. It only lasted two years. It only took them really two months to find out they got too, someone too hot for the position. But Jack had a similar position up in, in uh, Washington. He also found that somehow he couldn't live in that sort of a situation. But he visited us here in Palo, Palo Alto at that time. Uh, he must have been in one of his main eight phases. He was going to start a whole institution in a little town called Drain. And I talked to him later years. He never even remembered that pipe dream. But he went back and somewhat like me, he ended up in municipal employment. In my case, I worked in a landfill. I built a landfill. So I built a little geography in my life. And Jack, I know his initial job was just walking the streets doing inventories of the housing in Queens for the city. In any case, Jack was somewhat of a mystic, some of you may know. And he often would talk about the Jungian sense of simultaneity of events. And so one of the things that happens, I have a granddaughter was going to school in the East, in Boston, but she had a whole semester in Washington, in, in New York last year. And so I made an arrangement for her to go to visit Jack. Jack was very kind. It was not the best time of his life, but nonetheless, he said, yes, let, let her come. And so she did, and he got, she got a good orientation to his place and I enjoyed it. But here was this kind of strange simultaneity as this very event began. And I started watching who should come in the door but Emma, the very girl that had visited him. And this simultaneity seemed like somehow harmony over the decades. Though Jack would not think of himself as a radical geographer, he was somewhat more than that. He certainly was part of it from my point of view. And I appreciate his life and my ability to be able to speak to his importance. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? if? Uh, raise your hand if you can't find the, uh, there it is. Okay, Chris Lewis. Can you, can you, can you, can you, can you oh, me? sorry, I can hear you now. Hi, um, good evening, everybody. First, thank you, everybody, for coming out. This was really meaningful for us. Um, I'm Chris, that's fiance. Um, unfortunately, I have been ill and was not able to make it out here this evening. Um, to touch about what Clark said, yeah, um, the synchronicities Jack was very big on, and he didn't believe in coincidences. Um, and we would talk about this a lot. And also, um, 
I met Jack back in 2016 um, at the first Thanksgiving and Beth and I went to together uh, at Robbins and Jack was there and he immediately took a liking and, and welcomed me into the family from the get-go. And I got to know Jack over the last seven years now and we connected very much on that intellectual level and and i i will greatly miss the ability to ask the deepest trivia of, of any sort of thing we would be driving somewhere and i also was able to be his caretaker for the last year um so you know that was a that was a good bond to have towards the end um and we would drive past something and he would point out, he's like, do you know why this is named this? And do you know why this is named this street? And a lot of times we would kind of have the same thing. Uh, he would tell me over and over again, but I just loved the fact that I could ask seemingly the most specific, obscure details about something. And he would know it. He wouldn't even have to think about it. He could just whip it out. And I was, I was never just, I was always in awe of the ability to do that. I am deeply interested in in new york city i grew up here um jack and i also had the connection of michigan i moved out there in my 20s i lived out there for almost 10 years all these places were very familiar um you know clark you're talking about wayne state um i worked with many of the professors there i managed an art supply store made good connections um jack really it, it was he's as many people have already said, he was one of a kind. I, I don't think any of us will meet another person like him in our lifetimes. Um, just really humble, kind, compassionate person. He, he was deeply caring. He was very just warm, obviously had quite a lot of friends. He was deeply respected. Um, and to be considered family, it, it's an honor, and I am very grateful to have gotten to meet him and gotten to know him um, and to be called, you know, family. I, I What else can you ask from that? Um, again, I'm sorry I was not able to attend. We've been preparing for this for a while, and this is pretty upsetting, but I'm glad we were able to, you know, through the technology, which is also ironic because Jack was very much an in-person kind of guy, and the idea of having this, you know, I think he'd understand, you know, for this, make an exception for this, but um, yeah, that's, that's all. He, he will be missed. He was a good guy and I'm glad, I'm glad I got to know him. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any, any, anyone else? I think maybe we've covered everybody just about. You would like to? Oh, absolutely. No, no, no. Bob, hold on. Hi. Um, we have a very small family, and um, I just wanted to mention what Jack meant to me. Um, I always called him uncle growing up. And um, even though Jack spent a long time, you know, obviously he um, had a lot of outside interests and he was always traveling, always going to exciting places, coming back with um, more South American textiles that were hanging all over the apartment, which made his apartment feel like another world, which is, I loved it. I loved going to his apartment. Um, he was a special person to me, even though I never saw him that many times a year growing up. I, you know, like basically it was, you know, we saw him on holidays, sometimes on birthdays. Um, and he just, a, a lot of you guys have mentioned his interest, how smart he was, how kind he was, how compassionate he was. But I think I want to talk about how brave he was and how much of an an inspiration he was to me. Um, 
my family and Jack himself never ever hid the fact that he was both a homosexual and, and, and bipolar. And those things, you know, while we, you know, accept them now, and I know they were coming to more acceptance, it was a big deal to have a family member be that open and to feel never felt ashamed when I went through my own mental health crises that nobody could understand or there was nobody there to talk to because he was always open about it. So that was a big thing for me. And I just think that his ability to be open and tell people about it and ask for help were bigger lessons that I ever realized at the time. Um, and more than that, he also just was a huge inspiration in my life. You know, I would go to Hanukkah and, you know, he would give me gifts from the used bookstore. <laughs> and, you know, as a kid, I was like, why am I getting a used book? Because, you know, that's what you do when you're a kid. But they were the best books ever. I, they were inspirational. They were intelligent. They respected my intelligence. They weren't condescending. They were books that I kept for years and I still keep. I looked up the authors and got more books by the authors. I, I, I treasure any book from Jack <laughs> and always will. Um, and I just, I, yeah, that's, I just, he was a brave, brave man, you know, what can you say about somebody that looked, went to the library and looked up the fact that homosexuality was li listed as a mental illness and then developed mental illness, you know, so uh, those were just some thoughts I wanted to share. Um, and um, I'm just gonna, I, I don't want to go into, you know, you guys have covered a lot of great things about him. Um, I did go on some of his tours. The last one I went on was in 2019, where he um, did take me to some places in family uh, history, where my grandparents met the dry cleaning that used to be a dry cleaning store in Bayside. He took me to he showed me a house where my grandmother had lived before um, her family lost money in the depression and they had to move, which I had never seen before. And he was ecstatic that I showed up, of course. And we had been planning um, to, with Chris's help, um, to have him do another tour because it lifted him so much. And we were gonna maybe push him in a wheelchair so he could still do the tour if he got tired. Um, that was on the agenda, but um unfortunately you know um I, his last week of life he w had a wonderful wonderful cruise thanks to his um somebody was saying that other people in florida possibly are not here but his friend howard is i believe zooming howard was very instrumental in making that trip a wonderful experience for jack and he was glowing when he came back from that he was just it was it was really um beautiful to see i know he told me he had some very vivid dreams that week also so most of a lot of his dreams last few years were um about him being able to walk freely again so let's hope that's what he's doing now and i just wanted to share a poem with you that he quoted at me after he broke his foot and I think uh, he was trying to keep his own spirits up, but he has a big poster of it in his bedroom that I found also, like a print of it. So if we're closing, I'd like to read it, if that's okay. It's um, named Desert Dorada by Max Ehrman. Go placidly amid the noise and haste, and remember what peace there may be in silence. As far as possible without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. Speak your truth quietly and clearly and listen to others, even the dull and the ignorant, they too have their story. Avoid loud and aggressive persons and people on their cell phones. <laughs> I know if you ever saw Jack yell at people on cell phones. <laughs> they, are, they are vexations to the spirit. If you compare yourself with others, you may become vain and bitter, for always there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. 
Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans. Keep interested in your own career, however humble. It is a real possession in the changing fortunes of time. Exercise caution in your business affairs, for the world is full of trickery. But let this not blind you to what virtue there is. Many persons strive for high ideals, but everywhere life is full of heroism. Be yourself, especially do not feign affection, either be cynical about love, for in the face, I'm sorry, neither be cynical about love, for in the face of all aridity, aridity and disenchantment, it is perennial as the grass. Take kindly the counsel of the years, gracefully surrendering the things of youth. Nurture strength of spirit to shield your, you in sudden misfortune. But do not distress yourself with dark imaginings. Many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. And you have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is, as, is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive him to be, and whatever your labors and aspirations in the noisy confusion of life, keep peace with your soul. With all its sham, drudgery, and broken dreams, it is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful, strive to be happy. And with that, uh, we conclude this incredible event. And uh, I think if we've learned anything, it's that when Jack made a friend, he kept a friend and uh, we are all better for it. Um, so, uh, you know, go in peace. Um, I'd like to make sure again, I thank Beth for her efforts and organizing this for um, Amy, Amy Jew for all the work she did. Uh, and thank the crew, the AV crew of Roosevelt House. Thank you, guys. It's smooth as silk, so a job well done. And um, with that, good night and have a good trip home. <laughs>